Hi there, you're listening to the Practical Stoic Podcast with your host, me, Simon Drew. If you'd like to listen to over 200 episodes that were recorded before 2020, then you can head to my Patreon site. It's patreon.com forward slash Simon J. E. Drew. We'd love to have you there and any support is greatly appreciated. We'd love to also have you on our Facebook community, The Practical Stoic Mastermind. But for now, enjoy the show. Hi there, my name's Simon Drew and welcome to The Practical Stoic Podcast. Now, today I've got a really interesting conversation that I had with David Ropeek. Now, I first saw David on the Bill Mayer show about just over a week ago. Uh, and I thought, I have to get this guy on because he's, he's, he's so knowledgeable on the way that humans behave, the way they act, especially in risky and 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 uh, troubling circumstances. So uh, very knowledgeable and uh, just a really interesting conversation that he had with Bill Mayer. And I wanted to kind of expand on a few of those ideas that he was talking about, because uh, I really do believe that the more we understand about the human condition, uh, the more we can understand how to behave correctly in circumstances like we're going through at the moment, especially. But I'll tell you a little bit more about David Ropeek. So David Ropeek is a retired Harvard instructor, author, and consultant on the psychology of risk perception, uh, risk communication, and also risk management. He was the principal faculty member of the professional education course, the Risk Communication Challenge at the Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, he is the author of How Risky Is It Really? Uh, Why Our Fears Don't Always Match the Facts, and also principal co-author of Risk, A Practical Guide to Deciding What's Really Safe and What's Really Dangerous in the World Around You. So prior to teaching at the Harvard School of Public Health, he was a television reporter in Boston, uh, twice winning the DuPont Columbia Award, which is often referred to as the Pulitzer Prize of Broadcast Journalism. So we're very lucky to have him on the show. Very fortunate that he was willing to give us his time during uh, during this global crisis to give us the best information that he has. And honestly, I just had such a great conversation with him elaborating on some of the ideas that he talked about with Bill Mayer. And, uh, and again, I just really hope that you enjoy the episode. Make sure you head to all of the links below. I'm going to put the links to where you can get his books, where you can go to his website, and make sure you reach out and let him know how much you appreciate him coming on the show. But uh, without any further ado, I present to you the powerhouse, uh, David Ropeek. Okay, so we are very, very lucky to have David Ropeek here. Uh, David, I, I saw you on uh, on the Bill Maher show, Bill Maher, uh, th- th- about a week ago, and and I thought I have to get this guy on. You you know you're so knowledgeable in terms of um, you know the way that humans act and the way that we react in certain uh, situations, um, you know, and and so I think that I just wanted to give you an opportunity first to tell everybody a little bit about who you are, what you do, and then we can jump in and, and hopefully discuss some very important matters at a time like this. Thanks for those listening so that they can decide how much stock to place in the two cents that I will offer. Uh, <laughs> I started my professional life as a television reporter in Boston and started to see as time went on that no matter the topic of what I was covering, there were people who were more afraid of the risk that was at the heart of the story than the evidence said they needed to be, or in some cases were not as afraid as they should be based on the evidence. So I actually studied up on the psychology of why that common phenomenon occurred, and it had been studied, and I started to report on that. And then when I left that career in 2000, I joined the Harvard School of Public Health, where I started teaching it, the psychology of risk perception, and how to use an understanding of people's underlying the reasons for their feelings to communicate about risk more effectively. And so I taught that at Harvard and consulted in that for 16 or 17 years before retiring. I wrote a couple books about it. Um, How risky is it really? Why our fears don't always match the facts. That's the book that gathers all of this research. I'm a journalist who has put it all together rather than having figured it out myself though. So this sort of proselytizing that we'll get into in our conversation represents only my, my effort to bring that knowledge to greater public awareness. Mm. Yeah, but, but I'm very interested in that, you know, that I think that that's really valuable people like yourself who kind of can draw connections from various disciplines, connections that you think haven't been made yet. 
right? That really can help us to understand humans and how they act. And I, I guess it's been, you know, pretty much a week since you were, were on Bill Maher's show. And, and, you know, I want to, I want to know from you now that, you know, now that things are really kicking up, you know, a lot of places are just going into full lockdown. What do you see in this current situation from your perspective and the information that you have? What's going on? Well, when I spoke on Mar, which was two weeks ago, they reran it last week. Um, we were just a day, really, literally a day into the idea of social distancing. This phrase is that, yeah. that has now swept the planet and has become part of our lexicon going forward in the future. So at that stage, we were still mostly afraid of the disease itself only. We hadn't been thrown into this massive uncertainty about mm. life itself and normalcy itself and this social isolation and disruption of um, normal rhythms and interference with our economic well being. That was all, that is all new subsequent to that. So let me start with the fears that got us all going briefly and then describe to your question where I see things now. Um, initially, when any new risk comes along, as this disease was, uh, there are a number of emotional factors that tend to make us more alarmed, just off the bat, before we know anything. And in fact, before we know anything is part of why we get extra alarmed. It's precautionary. Um, when we don't know how to protect ourselves, that means we don't feel like we have the control we need to protect ourselves and that's vulnerability. So we're extra precautionary, which generally makes sense. It has helped us get this far along evolution's gantlet after all. Mm. Um, if that snake is a poisonous snake, better to jump back first and then protect yourself than figure out later that you were stupid for jumping back because it wasn't poisonous. Okay, so there's the newness. There's also the um, heightened general awareness of the threat that was sweeping the world uh, a couple of weeks ago. And what that does cognitively is it blows everything else off our conscious radar screen, right? Who was thinking about anything else at the time? Um, so what that does is it overwhelms the reason part of our thinking with uh, fear, emotion, worry, anxiety, whatever you want to call it. The healthy brain is wired such that emotions easily overwhelm reason the amygdala and the other limbic system parts of our brain, which are down in the bottom of the brain stem, more ancient uh, parts of the brain, have a louder voice than the prefrontal cortex where we do our thinking and our philosophizing, mm. talk about on your show. So high awareness gives more of an edge to emotion. Let me summarize that point. There's a third point, uh, then and now. We our brains are lazy. Our brains evolved when we weren't sure where the next weather, when, when or where or whether the next meal would occur. Hmm. And the brain right now, as you and I are talking, consumes 25% of our calories, as much as. So not being sure when the next load of calories was going to be available, our brain figured out ways, evolved ways, to cut corners to jump to conclusions, to take a few facts and turn them into our perceptions on which we act. Well, we still do that. And in this social media era, as never before, we are bombarded with information from largely trusted sources because those are the ones we've picked to be our feeders, our aggregators. Um, and we grab that information and go. We don't check it out. We don't think. Um, so that lazy brain, as other people call it, Daniel Kahneman and other people call it, um, exacerbates the voice of emotion further, right? Mm. The reason part has less of a say because it takes more effort to do that. Mm. It's easy to just go, yeah, 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 I heard, I heard, I heard. Okay. So those are the things that really got us started, most of, most of them. Actually, there's one other element that I should add because it's part of our response now. So we have never been through this in modern human history, in its specifics. But in its generalities, we have. Not in our modern social media age, but only a few years ago, we went through SARS, and a few years before that, MERS and Ebola started spreading out of uh, African countries. 
um, we have previously experienced, oh my God, is this going to be 1918 again? Is this the new pandemic? The thing that we've been warned about is coming. And there's a, a truism about how cognition works that's relevant there. It's called the availability heuristic, heuristic being an academic term for mental shortcuts. Okay. The brain has learned that when a memory comes screaming out of memory into consciousness faster and louder as fear memories do to pay more attention to it. Well, we have learned to be afraid of here comes the next pandemic. So while this is different in its details, we do have a memory of this kind of fear adding to the alarm of what's going on now. So that catches us up to where we were. And um, then now in the last week or two, we've added in um, a couple other profound psychological factors, I think, as I read the literature. So the first one is the massive uncertainty of what's going to happen. It was uncertainty about the disease itself. Now it's an uncertainty about life itself. Mm. Our jobs, our relationships, our school, our um, the retirements, our everything, in addition to our health. Mm. Um, so on top of all the other alarms that are still ringing, we have what the hell is going to happen with normal C? And there can't be much more unsettling and disempowering and making you feel vulnerable than that. But in addition to that, there, there are a couple other factors kicking in. One is the anxiety of social isolation. So yes, here we are talking <laughs> online, but that's not the same as if I were there or you here. Um, we are socially isolated. We're stuck in our little abodes and, and physically separated, save for our little walks in the afternoon. Um, social animals don't like that. Social animals need social contact for the reassurance that I'm still part of a tribe that can help protect me, mm. that it's still out there. Yeah. Um, and um, isolation alone, just being alone, um, has been shown repeatedly to raise anxiety and contribute to a depressed immune system and elevated heart rate and so forth. So these are additional elements on top of all the other emotional garbage. But here comes the good news, saved for last. We are demonstrating an unprecedented amount of social altruism. Mm. We see the examples of people who aren't socially distancing and staying inside and flaunting it and whatnot. We also see that most of those people are badly stigmatized, shamed, because most of society is showing the social altruism of, I'm gonna stay inside not only for my own health, but for the greater common good. And people who violate that are shunned. And literally, that is part of our instinctive self-protection process, right? So mostly evolutionary psychology says that we um, prefer kin selection. We sacrifice resources that we're not going to get back in favor of getting our own genes passed on, right? Our, our own kin, yeah. right? Yeah. But, um, and in academia, that seems to be the, the chief thinking. But there are a lot of people, myself included, who believe they were also socially altruistic in the name of our own protection. Because mm. a world that works that way that I'll jump on the grenade for my fellow soldiers means that when it's a grenade over there and there's another guy closer, he'll jump on it from me. Yeah. And that increases my chances too. That is adaptive behavior. And so the unprecedented circumstance of all being threatened by this all, I mean, globally all set aside every other group identity that we normally have. Um, all being threatened by the same thing at the same time, and viscerally so, not just abstractly so, like climate change, um, is bringing out a social altruism that is sweeping, profound, strong, expressing itself in so many ways, the Italians singing in alleyways, mm. and people making masks for nurses, and all sorts, I'll pick up your groceries for you, elderly neighbor, et cetera. That will be a lesson that will stay with us after this. Yeah. Um, that's a long-winded answer, but that's a lot of what now is going on that adds yeah. to how it's started. Well, yeah, that's, <clears throat> that's a brilliant start to our conversation because you've given us you know, exactly the way that you see it, and I love that. And 
the reason I've been so excited to talk to you as well is, you know, the philosophy that we kind of talk about on here, Stoicism, there are a lot of really interesting parallels between the way that you speak and the way that they did, you know, 2000 years ago, even things like social animals, you say, you know, they would teach that, okay, one thing that we know about human beings is a, we're social creatures and B, we, we kind of might tend to have the ability, although not all people use it, to tap into our more rational side from time to time. And we should use rationality to improve our social relationships. But in terms of the control aspect, right, the Stoics taught us that, okay, there's some things that are outside of your control. That's pretty much everything. And there's only a couple of things that are really in your control, even if that is the case, which is maybe your ability to step outside things for a moment and try to view things from a rational standpoint. And I saw this advertisement last night uh, for the Catholic church in America saying, welcome home or something like that. And it made me think, wow, this is actually the best time for churches to be advertising, right? Because this is what people are looking for in a time like this, right? They're looking for some sense of control amidst all of the chaos. Can you talk to us a little bit about our human need to find control when we're losing it and where we turn to for that control? Absolutely. Um, by the way, one of my favorite quotes about risk perception comes from Epictetus who said, we're not afraid of things, we're afraid of how we feel about things, yeah. something like that. He said it much yeah. more eloquent than that, but that captures exactly what risk perception is about. It's about a feeling, not the facts alone. Mm. Ergo, our, our, our belief in uh, pure objective reason to figure things out is, um, well, there's a lot of other cognitive stuff besides his quote that says, no, that's not how we do it. Mm. Um, so as social animals, we apparently have evolved this is what the evidence suggests to me, to seek protection from our group, our tribe, whatever we want to call it, when we can't protect ourselves from things that we can't protect ourselves from, bigger things. Um, and the more afraid we are, the more we turn to our tribe for our sense of protection. Right now in the world, in my opinion, there's a lot of evidence from the rise of nationalism and populism and the splits of Brexit and here in the United States and in Poland and lots of places um, that people don't feel they're in control of their lives, of their lives. The globalization, the rapid speed of technological change, um, the liberalization of many social values, who can marry and, and whatnot, um, leave a lot of people feeling like they're not in control of their lives. In the United States, it's the left saying, the rich are in control of our lives, a great deal of which is true. On the right, it's saying government is in control of our lives, which is, there's a lot of truth to that too. Mm. They're both saying the same thing. They're both saying, we don't feel like we have control over our lives. And there are a lot of reasons for that, some of which I mentioned. So when we don't feel that sense of empowerment, we, we feel more vulnerable. We can't steer the car we're in. It's like we're sitting in the passenger seat, or in your case, in the passenger seat, whatever side it is that you ride on. Um, the wrong side, by the way. Um, <laughs> nonetheless, um, we turn to our tribe for the power and protection that we don't feel like we have for ourselves. And that makes us more tribal. Ergo Brexit. Ergo the divisions in the United States. Ergo the divisions over um, things in Brazil and, Czech and, and Hungary and so forth. Um, so a lack of control, to get to the end of the answer, summary of the answer, drives us toward the protection of and the power of the group that we don't have as individuals. And the more afraid we are, and specifically because we don't have control, the more um, um, powerful that becomes. However, to note something, sometimes we belong to the tribe of this side or that on Brexit, or this side or that on the, the right or the left in the United States, or um, you know, Man U or Man City, or you know, whatever tribe you wanna to belong to. In this case, all of those are being superseded by the one tribe that we all belong to, humanity. Ergo, the social altruism, which is a mm. manifestation of the same thing. We are all in this together, and together we are stronger to protect ourselves than others because we don't have control alone. Yeah, no, that's, that's brilliant. And 
that's why I really think we need as, as, as horrible as it sounds, we need times like these, right. To shake us up and to remind us all that there's something so much bigger than just your individual life or my individual life. There is the life of humanity as a whole. And I wanted to know, is there a certain, is there a certain comfort and, and power that comes from understanding how little you do control? Like, is, is there a power of just letting that go and, and understanding that maybe, you know, biologically, as you say, there are, there's so many reasons why we act. There's so many reasons why we do things. What is the power of letting go of that control and understanding that maybe you're not so much run by yourself, but by the group thing? Haven't thought about that question as I do, based on what I know of our biology, which drives mm. our cognition. Most, I mean, you just asked me a question that set in motion a bunch of biology that's going to come out as my answer. Yeah. The start is the biology. The start yeah. of fear is, is the stimulus that makes you afraid, and then your mind becomes aware that your heart is beating, and then you become consciously afraid. I mean, I'm very reductionist about where our consciousness comes from. And we're mostly about keeping our own genes alive until tomorrow, mm. not letting go. There are an awful lot of people, as you probably know in your discussions on this program, who stubbornly resist the idea that we don't have free will because they mm. want to have free will because that's control. For yeah. me, not for society, I want to think that I can think so strongly that I can control my car, my life, my whatever. Um, I think that it's probably beneficial for anyone to slow down and disconnect from, forgive me, the podcast world and the mm. cell phone world and online world and separate from that. So that's not the same as giving up control, but it is um, similar in that um, it is a separating from. Mm. Um, that's smarter people than me have said that's healthy for a long time. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that our instinct for survival, which is, you know, we're genetically driven to do two things, get to tomorrow and procreate. Mm. And um, we're going to hang on to whatever increases our chances of that. And letting everybody else drive the car and feeling okay about that is that's for the Buddhas and the Confucius and maybe the Epictetuses. Yeah. I don't think that's probably likely going to feel okay for most people. I, yeah. Just off the top of my head. No, I, I think you're right about that. And, and like you've said before as well, you know, we, we tend to, our, our brain prioritizes our emotions over our rationality, right? Like, so we're, we're constantly in a state of reacting to our emotions that pop up uh, in various situations. You may have just answered this, but do you think that there is a way for us to tap into the side of our mind that has that rationality. I mean, I look at it as two ways, right? There's like, what's true? What's true might be that we have no control whatsoever and that we are purely acting in a biological way, just trying to survive to tomorrow. But even Sam Harris said that you should not teach your kids this. You should tell them that they have the ability to try and act correctly, try and make the right decision. Um, and so it's like, what's true and what's helpful? What do you think is helpful for people in terms of thinking about the way that they act? Well, there, there's a bunch in there. Let me get back to the beginning of your, of your comment that, that we're constantly reacting to our emotions. Mm -hmm. It's really important to get over the point that we're not reacting to our emotions. Our emotions, in fact, are a reaction to biologically what's already underway. Yeah. So yes, then our emotions become part of how we feel and a dynamic in what we respond to. We get angry. We're conscious we're angry. We act on the anger. So that's an important distinction. But as to um, your central question, it's not as though we can't stop and think. And it's not as though reason can't overwhelm emotion. It does. As my friend Steven Pinker writes in Enlightenment Now, because our brain can do that, we've made all this progress. Wow. Mm. Right? We have Zoom. <laughs> right? Yep. Wow. Right? Um, it's not as though we can't. But we have to work hard to do it. Because it's not instinctively what the brain does first. Hmm. And 
We have to really want to do it in order to do that work. We're fighting against the brain's instinct to cut corners and be lazy. We're literally fighting the lazy brain. And this is the work of Daniel Kahneman and all of the cognitive scientists for 40 years, that, that whole literature. Um, well, what do we want, mostly, to get to tomorrow? So in terms of Sam and Jonathan Haidt and other thinkers about what should we teach our kids and the, the question, he's talking about teaching our kids morality. He's talking about teaching our kids and behaving ourselves in a way that is um, right, socially mm -hmm. acceptable. Well, what are those rules for except for society to get along and everything to work so that we have better chance to survive? Pardon mm -hmm. me for being derivative about this, right? But morality is what so helps society work and helps people not whack each other and compete constantly. That's all they are. It's the same as with manners, for God's sake. It's the same thing. They're all grease for our functioning well, which inures to our safety, uh, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Now, there's another thing that you said in your, in your comment that I really want to spend a moment with and see what you think talking too much. Um, truth. As far as I understand this much, very little of what the Stoics said, there's no such thing. Hmm. Yeah, I think I'm wrong, I, but you and I, for example, can look at the microphone in front of you and say two different things about it. and We'd both be right. And broadly, is the earth round or flat? Or, you know, is that dress blue or black? Remember the thing that went around online? Um, there are only uh, pieces of physical evidence, and then there are our interpretations about them, like I was quoting Epictetus earlier. So the fact that there is some accepted factual truth about anything that all of us will accept, which is kind of what we mean as the truth, um, is an open question. Hmm. Scary, but an open question in my mind. It is, and, and, and the Stoics kind of talked about this. From what I understand, uh, Massimo Pigliucci helped me to understand this. He said that the Stoics kind of mixed with the skeptics and the cynics, and they were, you know, obviously this, the skeptics were like, well, you know, there's no such thing as perfect knowledge. There's just nobody exists who ha would have a perfect knowledge of, of truth. And then the Stoics said, well, okay, well, let's say we have the sage. Maybe in theory, it might be possible for somebody to get to the stage where they can see truth. But in practice, it's very difficult for us to get there because all that we see is what we see, right? We don't see what we can't see. Um, but, but I think that what's really interesting about our times now is you see how everybody acts as a humanity. And like you've said, in times like these, we kind of all pull together and we think, okay, the moral thing to do is to stay in my house to protect the herd, right? Would that not also suggest that in times when we are tested, uh, almost a central underlying biological morality is revealed because we all start acting in a way that protects the herd? Yes, and that's exactly what we're seeing, but I don't think that transfers to everybody agreeing on all the facts about most things that we disagree on. Yeah. So that's still in there. We, we don't wipe out all the other stuff of who we are and how we're thinking and those other identities, even though this one is currently superseding those, mm. right? So yeah. I could find lots of people who think that evolution never happened, who agree with me that COVID is scary <laughs> yeah. and who are sitting inside, but they still don't believe in evolution because yeah. that's truth that keeps them safe within their tribal identity. That's still there too for them. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical of the idea that we can all come to the same perception of the evidence. That's, hmm. that's what, how I should put it, right? A, a, a universal perception of the shape of the earth. <laughs> You'd think yeah. that'd be easy, and we're, yet we can't do that one, right? You would think it'd be easy, but... <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and I think that, that what's really interesting about this is it, it is, it does really come down to that question of what's true and what's useful, right? Because it's like, I mean, a government's job isn't necessarily to tell everybody the hardcore facts of everything. A government's job is to make sure that as many people within that society can play the game and have an opportunity to, I guess, experience life in a good way. And it's the same with religions. It might not necessarily be the religion's purpose to, you know, particularly uh, 
enforce a certain truth, but it might be to be useful to people in order to help them to find some sense of control in their life. So I guess I'm interested in, in, you know, what we would, what we would, we could even say, what would you tell people in a time like this? Would you tell them trust in your emotional instincts to a certain degree with a certain element of caution uh, because they're probably telling you something important? Or would you say, come over to a sort of rational side and try to tap into that side that allows you to act in, a, in, in the most effective way? Well, let's broaden it for, beyond just listening to the government and doing what they want. But mm -hmm. Here's what I am trying to tell myself and sharing with my friends. And it's general advice for when we're um, thinking about any risk, whether we're over-worried mm -hmm. about it or under-worried about it. The first message is we're thinking more with our emotions. <laughs> mm. I, yeah. I like to quote Ambrose Bierce from the Devil's Dictionary, who wrote, the brain is only the organ with which we think we think. Yeah. Right? So then the next thing is, thinking mostly with your emotions can feel right, but lead you into mistakes. Mm. Which is kind of obvious, regardless of your position on the risk, you know, what you think about GMOs or COVID or nuclear power or anything. Thinking with your emotions instead of carefully can get you into trouble. That's generally appealing. Haven't offended anybody yet. The next thing I say is, because the brain wants to do this, you know, jump to conclusions and use our emotions more than reason, the best way to counteract that is to stop. Yeah. Pause for effect, right? Stop the conversation in your brain between emotions and reason, where reason is losing, which gives reason more of a say. The mm. first and loudest voice in the conversation is emotion. Butt in. <laughs> Butt in literally with a pause in the interest of making a good choice. That, that's what I tell my friends and myself. The goal here is to make the healthiest choice. Do I go out and shop? Should I wear gloves? These are all choices about my own health and safety. I better make them as intelligently as I can. And if I make them without thinking off the first emotional response, it might not be the best choice. So stop, think about things a little extra than normal, mm. okay? Which then brings reason more into the conversation. You know, the cognitive scientists, Kahneman and others, and, and well before him coined this as a dual systems theory or dual process theory. Have you heard that phrase? I have heard the phrase, yeah. Okay, so there's system one and system two, and that's what we've been talking about. And system two is the takes longer, is harder, we don't want to, but comes up with, you know, I keep patting my prefrontal cortex here, comes up with more thoughtful choices. Just stopping gives it a little bit more say. And there's a, a final step. Question any information that you're getting as to its reliability. Not just its veracity, do I trust them or not, Mm. But is that person likely to know? Yeah. Right? Because I get lots of tweets from my friends who are, they're on my side in all of these groups, right? That's why they're in all of my feeds. But, you know, I got a tweet today from um, uh, an art restorer about a new medicine for COVID. You know, all I have to do is stop a little bit and think, well, maybe that's not her field. But yeah. I have to stop to do that. And then after you stop, just ask yourself, what's the veracity and the reliability and the trustworthiness of the information? And all of that does is let's reason have more of a say. And you're going to get mm. closer to a balanced conversation between feelings and reason. You can't wipe reason, um, emotion out. It's got a pretty mm. loud voice. But you can give reason more of a say if you work at it. And the reason to work at it is for survival. You make yeah. healthier choices. There's a good reason to do this effort. Yeah, that, that's brilliant. That's such good advice. It, it reminds me of this meme I just saw recently. I have to say it was, it was like a news station and they were saying, up next, our expert, Jan from Facebook. You know, like every, yeah, exactly. everybody becomes an expert in a time like this. But you make two really important points that I want to touch on. The first one is that whether you think you're acting out of emotions or not, you're acting out of emotions. It's pretty much Period. like... That's just how it is. And I actually think that that's really important to understand because uh, I've felt for a few months now that there's, there's got to be a lot of power 
in letting go of the rationality, letting go of your, your mind that tends to always tell you that, yep, you've just got to think it through. You've got to come up with a solution. Like maybe just stepping back and letting go of your overthinking mind from time to time is what's going to help you to actually move forward. And something you said there really speaks to this, this, this Buddhist story that I heard from an Alan Watts video. He was saying that somebody went to the Buddha and said, you know, I desire too much. I'm feeling too much pain because of the things that I, I desire. And the Buddha said, okay, well, go away and try to not try to desire to not desire. So he goes away. He comes back. Oh, and he says, look, I'm, sure I'm yeah, letting go. You know, I'm letting go of things. I'm not desiring so much, but now I'm really desiring to not desire. And he says, yeah. well, go away and try to desire to not desire. To not. And so you can see where this is going. It's like, you cannot do it. You cannot purely authentically think only through your rational mind and stop the clutter. You just cannot do it. And so all that's left to do is to kind of let go and pause for a moment, right? Well, yes, that's relaxing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, that's good if you, if you want to, you know, get past samsara, the Hindu idea of constantly going through rebirth you know, uh, and get to nirvana and enlightenment and all, uh, it's not particularly handy if there's a train heading toward you. Yeah. Right? So that's how we spend most of our life is with the train heading towards us. Mm. Not visually, but that's, we're on alert for getting to tomorrow. So um, I think more realistically, what I try to do is balance reason and emotion and i lose the battle all the time because i can know this stuff but knowing it is not diff it's the same as saying you know oh i'm above it that's Buddha. Yeah. um balance them know that the feelings way of working in the world feels right but sometimes causes problems um Gosh, I, I treat people differently. I treat my wife differently because of this, because I can feel the emotions dominating what is um, smarter. I, that's too fancy a word, but appropriate for treating other people or in my own best interest in those conversations. Um, and I just try and help my thinking brain have a little bit more of a say as I go. So I wouldn't call it, in my opinion, letting go of all the thinking and just being in the emotions. That's for like when I'm out in the woods and I'm looking for at the mm. river going by and I'm Siddhartha and all that sort of stuff. Um, I would call it, um, I wouldn't call it fighting, the two fighting against one or the other. I would call it using my capacities more evenly. Mm. Uh, I feel calmer when I do that. I feel less um, out of control. The emotions aren't driving my car. Uh, I feel like I have a little bit more uh, insight into myself and my own behaviors and the things that I'm thinking about. Um, as long as the calories in my mind last, and then it defaults to the lazy brain and, <laughs> and I get all emotional again. <laughs> yeah. No, I appreciate you sharing that because that, that actually clears up because I would, I would never tell people to, only act on your emotions right like it, because that sort of sends a connotation even though we know that that's all we ever do but i would never tell them to just relax and and only listen to their emotional responses i guess what i would say is understand how much you do actually run and how much you don't and maybe that'll help you to to see that okay there's there's a place for both right like you say and, and you can use them harmoniously and you don't have to feel bad if you mess up. You don't have to because you understand that so much of it is outside of your control. And it's not even messing up. So there's a pejorative to that. There's a pejorative mm. sense that intellectuals have, as we talked about in, 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 in before this interview online about, you know, there are people who think that reason is the right way and emotions are the wrong way. Mm. That, that people who are irrational and buy toilet paper are dumb or lesser than why aren't they smarter than me? There's a pejorative, there's an arrogance, there's an intellectual arrogance to denying yeah. the realities of human cognition. It's, it's repugnant to me because it says I'm smarter than you and in the process says I'm denying what evidence says that I'm not. Yeah. 
you know, and that's an arrogance. That's, that's just, you know, if you're aware of what cognition says and you still say that reason and rationality should always be able to dominate, that's, there's an intellectual arrogance to that. And as, as I mentioned, I've, I've known Steve Pinker for a while and we have this conversation back and forth while we're at a hockey game or drinking beer. So we stay friendly, but boy, you know, he's really in the reason can win camp and less than reason is an imperfection. Yeah. No, it's part of our reality and recognizing that and how it gets in the way of better choices is the first step towards putting it in its place and balancing the both yeah. so that we can use reason and enlightenment to move our progress forward as he and many people and, my, and I would, would hope. Yeah. Well, so it's we, kind of, it's, it's brilliant what you're saying there. And, and I think that I'm so glad that I got you on because this can, See, talking to people like yourself can really help us to understand the philosophy even better, right? And so there's even this idea in Stoicism of soft determinism, which is like, yeah, you know, we can kind of interact with our emotions and we can kind of try to change the direction, but also there is a very uncontrollable element to us. So it's kind of like you've got to recognize both sides, right? Huh. And I, I guess, I, guess um, I, I only have three more quick questions for you. I'll try and... Uh, try and be respectful of your time, but and I'll try and be briefer with my answers. <laughs> no, no, that no, you're, you're doing brilliant. Trust me. Uh, something that I used to tell people in the gym because I worked as a gym manager for a while, and I used to tell them all the time: if you eat the wrong foods or if you don't show up for your workout, don't stress because stress is the thing that will work against you in every situation. Like as yeah. soon as you start stressing, that actually shuts down your fat burning process. So you know you're stressing over the fact that you ate something terrible. And then all of a sudden you're making it even worse because you're stressing. So there's no point. What is stress doing to people in times like these? This is a brilliant, brilliant, important question. And, and I'll summarize what I've learned about this from two people. One who just passed away called Bruce McEwen, M-C-E-W-E-N, who um, was a real pioneer in what stress does to us biologically. He pioneered the idea of allostatic load I think he wrote a book called The End of Stress as We Know It, something like that, just passed away. And the other, even better, is Robert Sapolsky uh, mm -hmm. at Stanford, uh, who studied baboons, but also what stress does to them and then to us. And his best, most fun book is Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. That's great. <laughs> and, the answer to the, and the answer to the question is the answer to your question. So zebras don't get ulcers because they go into a fight or flight response and then they either get eaten or they get away and then they go out of a fight or flight response. So the stress that they're in doesn't last. Mm. They, the fight or flight response, stress, worry, anxiety, like we have right now with COVID, it's biological stress. It's a mini fight or flight response. Any anxiety. I didn't do my workout. Same thing in degree. On different only in degree. So what that does is it the fight or flight response turns up the systems we need to fight the lion. Think of it in simplistic terms, right? So we need focused eyesight, our peripheral vision goes down, our hearing gets more focused straight ahead, we um, stop digesting our meal and get it out of our body because that makes us lighter for running, right? Yeah. And we don't have to worry about getting lunch processed, right? When we are could be lunch, for the mm. lion, right? It raises our heart rate and our blood pressure. It depresses our immune system. Actually, over time, it does. At the very beginning, it raises your immune system. But then, after a few hours, it depresses your immune system. Well, if that comes back to normal, fine. If it doesn't, not fine. A yep. lot not fine. There is ample, ample, ample evidence that persistently more than normal stress, what McEwen called allostatic load, not allostatic stasis, that's the hassles of life that we're used to, mm. worry, but kind of normal worry, we adjust to that. But load, more than normal stress, that lasts in Sapolsky's estimation more than a couple weeks, raises your risk of heart disease, <laughs> Um, getting or suffering worse from infectious disease impairs your fertility, bone growth, hair growth, cognitive power. It literally dumbs you down because the stress hormones give more of a voice to your, oh my God, it could be dangerous conversation mm -hmm. in your brain. Chronic stress 
over a long period can actually destroy brain cells in your prefrontal cortex. Um, it raises the likelihood and severity of diabetes, uh, of clinical depression. It raises the likelihood of adult onset diabetes. It is wicked bad for mm. us to be stressed for more than several days. It is undoubtedly a massive health effect of this COVID threat. The COVID threat is the first tier threat. Yeah. The worry is right behind it because it's so severe and is lasting so long and it's going to continue to last for a mm. long time too as the disease reaches its peak over the next several weeks and then there'll be subsequent peaks. This fear and our raised anxiety is going to take a humongous toll on our health because of our elevated stress. It's a really important thing for us to recognize. Mm. And by recognizing it, to do what we can to reduce it. Turn off the radio, turn off the podcast, turn off the TV, walk the dog, binge watch your series, meditate, whatever. That's why that's good for your physical health. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and how, much, how much of that stress do you think is a result of the fact that humans don't only live in the present, they also live in the future and the past. <laughs> well, if you want an answer to that, watch a dog. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? Do they look stressed? No, except for when they're yeah. not getting their food. Right? Or unless you put that stupid Halloween costume on them. Mm. Right? No, they live in the moment. They are the ultimate Zen Buddhist masters. They are just now. There's no yesterday. There's no tomorrow. They have memories, of course, and they know us, and we have social relationships with them. As many animals, as many animals, where there's lots of cognition. You don't have to be human to just have cognition and even yeah. emotion. Uh, see, Franz de Waal is a great author on animal emotion. Um, but um, we are cursed by the power of our brains. Mm. To have everything, including yesterday and tomorrow, at hand, we are blessed because <laughs> it helps us get to tomorrow, yeah. but it adds a lot of baggage along the way. Mm. Uh, there are many, many times I remember walking my, my most favorite dog who just passed away saying, I wish I could be like you. I wish I, you know, we're walking around a pond, right? And I don't have to worry about where I'm going and I'm retired and I don't have anything on the calendar and I could be like him. I could be like him. I'm trying in this walk to be like him and I can't. I'm aware, like you were saying earlier, I'm aware of what I'm trying to not be aware of. And he's just looking up at me going, gosh, this is great. I'm here with you. So, you know, get a dog. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. I, I grew up with dogs and it's so true. That's, that might be one of the reasons why, you know, man and dog is like the perfect combination. It's like they complement each other, right? It's like, hey, I'm preparing for your future by giving you food and making sure that we have food. And, you know, you're teaching me that we can just be here enjoying this moment. And, and I he think- He taught me the most poignant example of this recently when we had to put him down. God rest his beautiful, beautiful, beautiful soul. He was eating beef jerky as the fellow was giving him the shot. The dog was happy. We were yeah. ending his life. He didn't know that. Yeah. He didn't have the knowing part to burden him. You know, and I hear your puppy barking in the background. So, yay. <laughs> That's somebody else's dog out there. Somebody but... else's baby barking. <laughs> but I'll go visit them. Um, I think we're blessed and cursed by our cognitive powers. Certainly blessed. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Um, well, but it's it, our biggest uh, strength and it's also our biggest weakness, right? It gets it, in the way more than anything else. And it also helps us more than anything else. It's just the ultimate rivalry, right? And to pretend that we can just be perfectly rational and get that stuff that's in the way out of the way is pretense. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I love that. That's such an important answer. And this might actually lead well into my next question, which is I've been feeling lately that so as societies get wealthier and life gets easier for a lot of people, it seems like humans create problems so that they can solve them again. It seems like there's some instinctual part of us that if life gets a little bit too easy, it says, hang on, you're getting a little bit too safe here. We need to throw a problem in your way so that you can solve something else and something else. It might be the reason we are here doing what we're doing, right? Is there a part of our biology that just creates problems over and over again so that we can solve them and, get, and become stronger? 
Well, I've thought about this in the context of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, that pyramid, right? Mm. So at the bottom, you need food and water, and then you need shelter, and then you need, and up here, you need like, uh, I think in the tip, what is it? It's like sustenance and pride and some other mushy stuff. Mm. All of that is to make you feel more powerful and safer. It's all about getting to tomorrow. The, at the top level, if you just want a Rolex watch or something, it's about, wow, I have power and control and money and assets and I feel better. I have a fancy house on top of a hill overlooking the water. I feel more in control. Sorry to do the gorilla thing here on my chest. Yeah. Um, I, I, as I see it, all of the aspirations at various levels of Maslow's hierarchy, if you use that as a framework for your question, are about the same thing, looking around for how I can get even higher up the pyramid where it's safer. Mm. And so we get up to where we're safe and we have all of the material stuff and we look around and we go, oh my God, uh, modern technology is destroying the natural world, which is true. But we weren't worrying about that down at the bottom when we were worried about food and water. Yeah. We find it. We find it, though, because of our instinct to always be looking around for ways to have things that we're fixing to make us feel safer and better. Hmm. Yeah. It might be. Yeah. No, that, that, that's perfect. It, it, it does explain a lot of things. It's just, it's so interesting how, you know, we call them first world problems, right? It's like these yeah, little problems that we've about made up. White that, people problems. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. and the way that I see it, it's like, okay, exactly like you were saying there, it's kind of, if somebody's putting a pin into my finger, I'm not going to feel the prick of that pin. If somebody's also simultaneously slud, like using a sledgehammer on my foot, right? Like, like the prick of the finger doesn't compute if my foot is literally being crushed. And so when you're somewhere where there's constant war, constant tribal warfare, you know, it's, it's hard to get food. It's hard to get anything good. All you can see is that giant problem of survival. Whereas in our societies where everything is relatively easy, those things are already taken care of. And so you focus on the prick, right? You focus on the little thing that's just a little bit nagging, right? Because even though the big problems are out of the way, you're still on alert for other problems that can keep you from getting exactly. to tomorrow. Yeah. So yeah. you look for them. Yes. Or you're, you're aware of signs that they might be there. It's not as though I wake up in the morning yeah. going, what can I fret about today? But yeah. you're sensitive to anything that might keep me from getting to where I want to be, which is alive in the morning. So it's not necessarily that we create the problems. It's just that we're more aware of the problems that we have our risk radar is always on alert and it doesn't have yeah. to worry about food and water, but it's still looking around. Yeah. Awesome. And, and my final question to you uh, has to do with my own personal risk radar. Uh, Cause I thought I better ask something uh, fun, something that would be helpful for a lot of people in these times where let's stop talking about coronavirus. I have a, I have a fear of spiders that I think that I got from my dad. Right. But what's been happening lately is I tend to uh, stop, pause in the moment, take a look at the spider, take pictures of it, try to understand it, uh, you know, try to research them. As I learn more and as I face the fear more, I'm mm -hmm. actually becoming more fascinated. Like what's happening here when we have these fears and then, and then how do we get over these fears if we can? So this is called cognitive behavioral therapy when it's done on purpose to you. And basically what it says is you are progressively introduced to something that scares the bejesus out of you to the point where you can actually physically contact a spider or fly on the plane or whatever and not have something bad happen. Mm. So bad with the spiders in your brain right now is imagined. I presume you've never been bitten to death by a spider or probably, not. Or probably even bitten and harmed by a spider because that rarely happens even that, right? Yeah. So it's a magic, right? So if you can encounter the stimulus that you're afraid of without it harming you, your brain learns that sometimes this isn't negative. It, and it literally adds to your um, instinct, instant subconscious inputs about that stimulus. So it's called cognitive behavioral therapy. There are brilliant uh, experiments in this, by the way, that have studied the brain chemistry of this to the point where there's actually a drug now. It's, uh, I don't think it's in human trials yet, but it has been found in um, mouse tests to um, erase fears. So what they do is 
Um, they expose the mouse to a scary stimulus um, and it doesn't harm them. Sometimes it's the rat in the cage with the, the electrical wire floor thing uh, and it doesn't harm them. So they've learned it's not negative and then they're given this drug. And if they're given the drug within a certain time window, I forget what it is, um, the next day when the bell rings that they had learned to be afraid of because after that the floor was going to shock, they don't jump. They've forgotten the fear. Mm. In your case, it's cognitive behavioral therapy. And we mm. can do this with ourselves. Um, I urge you to go online and look for, uh, I think it was a Danish or possibly a Swedish researcher who was uh, helping people who were paranoid about cats in one case and spiders in another mm. and used this drug in advance. I think she exposed them to the, the stimulus in a room. Oh, I'm, they were sweating. Oh, they were sweating. Oh, these poor people, you see them online. I don't need that. She has to drag them in the room, you know? And they're like way on the other side of the room and the cat is just sitting in the other corner, right? Or the spider's on a little table and they're dying. And, but they take them out of the room. See, it didn't hurt you. They take them in this other room and they could use this drug because it was approved for something else. And they take them back in the room and the guy wants the spider to crawl all over him. Yeah, wow. Yeah, man. <laughs> Look yeah. up the video. Get some yeah. of that drug at your, at your chemist and see how good. <laughs> We can, the point, the point of this fun thing is we can unlearn some fears. If they're in us for deeper psychological reasons, you know, I don't know what your dad did to you with the spiders, right? We're not going to go there. <laughs> That's a different thing altogether. But the general fears we have of common things, spiders, the dark heights, um, social rejection. The biggest fear mm -hmm. that most people have isn't physical, it's public speaking. And the reason for that is if you stand up there and they don't like you, the tribe's rejecting you and you are unsafe. Yeah, wow. Right? Or if a friend doesn't like you, a mate doesn't like you, if you get fired, if a, if a, you know, a, a partner doesn't reject you, that social rejection makes you unsafe. And we have on the list of what we're afraid of, there's the physical ones and the social ones, and the social ones are higher up. Uh, we're more afraid of them. But you can learn to get over that too with cognitive behavioral therapy as you're working on yeah. informally with spiders and and yeah that that's brilliant and i i have i have to bring this up at the moment because yeah, uh donald robertson literally wrote a book about stoicism and cognitive behavioral therapy right oh geez so, oh well, so, boy <laughs> so so you know <laughs> that this is this is why i'm so glad that i brought someone like you on because i think that people from different disciplines what we can find is major connections between philosophies and and science and 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 all of these different understandings that we have now like donald robertson has done here basically saying listen all of this cognitive behavioral therapy this comes directly from a two thousand year old philosophy right about the fact that hey like face the things that you are afraid of they will become easier for you to deal with you know and so uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm often at times like this pardon my interruption i'm often at this um at times like this reminded of the book uh the title of which everything i needed to know in life i learned in kindergarten yeah have you heard of that book i i have not heard of it no okay you know it basically says the basics are obvious Mm. The basics are obvious. So what the philosophers did, in many cases, is express those basics in grand philosophical terms. And here along comes cognitive science and other things that says, yep, they were right. But yep. it really is obvious. When I say that it's a more frightening, uh, risk is more frightening when we don't have control, you don't need some scientist or some journalist to tell you that. It's like, duh, yeah. right? It is pretty, a lot of this is pretty obvious. They, the philosophers crystallized it conceptually for us. Um, the evidence confirms it. Um, and, and it is brilliantly um, interconnected. It's mm. all part of who we are and siloing it away is, uh, that's for academics and book writers, you know, to have their own fields. Yeah. Stuff. But here we all are a mix of all of this stuff. Well, yeah, David, I just, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, how risky is it really? I want people to get that book. I'm going to put all of the links to, to where they can find your books, your website, everything in the show notes. Um, I'm just really grateful that you came on the show. So thank you so much for spending your time with me. And thank you for an enlightening conversation. 
Okay, so there you have it, my interview with David Ropeek. Now, I'm so grateful that he came on the show, and I'm sure you guys got a lot out of that. Make sure you head to the links, grab his books. Uh, they're all in the show notes there, and make sure you reach out to him and let him know how much you appreciate him coming on the show. But uh, I really hope that you enjoyed the episode, and we've got plenty more great episodes to come with incredible people. So uh, I look forward to that. But until then, I'll talk to you next time, and uh, I hope this episode has helped you on your rise to the good life. Ciao. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Practical Stoic Podcast. If you'd like to stay up to date with the Practical Stoic community and everything to do with this podcast, then just go to my website, simonjedrew.com and subscribe to the Practical Stoic Weekly, a newsletter that I send out every week with updates and all sorts of great Stoic insights. You can also find me everywhere online by searching Simon J.E. Drew. See you next time.